Still in Kenya, Kenya and Zimbabwe have signed seven bilateral agreements seeking to boost investments between the two countries during the talks held at the State House in Nairobi. Two countries signed the bilateral agreements on political and diplomatic consultations, tourism, wildlife conservation, civil aircraft accidents, serious incident investigations, women empowerment, and community development, uh, as, long as, as well as sports and recreational activities. To Ghana, the Ghanaian government says it is committed to reducing the country's housing deficit through policies and programs. Recent data on housing, as released by Ghana's statistical service, puts Ghana's national housing deficit at 1.8 million units. Ghana has a current housing census report on housing characteristics, which the housing minister uh, presented recently, assuring that his ministry was working towards eradicating impediments facing Ghanaians in owning decent quality and affordable accommodation. Joining us to discuss further is the CEO of Alpha African Advisory, Sayadi Okoli. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to have you again. Um, morning, second time this week. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you make of Ghana's? Let's start with uh, Ghana's. Um, what do you make of Ghana's approach to, uh, I guess, reducing the housing deficit and, I guess, providing more affordable housing? Well, it makes sense. Obviously, the first thing is to acknowledge that there is a problem, and Ghana has acknowledged that there is a problem. And identifying what for them are the key areas that they need to address. What's interesting is, you know, if we're comparing Ghana and Nigeria, it's easy to just look at the absolute numbers and think, okay, this is tiny. Mm. But in terms of, I was looking at it vis-a-vis -vis number of households and what the housing deficit represents as a percentage of the households. Uh -huh. And so for Nigeria, this deficit number that's been banded around, well, numbers between 17 million and 22 million, but right. I'll be the first to admit that that 17 million has been a number. Static. Static. For years. And certainly, certainly since 2006. <laughs> right. And that has always puzzled me as population. At that time, the population was about probably 160 million. Yeah, yeah. The housing deficit was 17 million. And we still hear that number. We uh, understand the um, Minister Fashala of Housing was questioning the number. Right. But anyway, if we still He actually work with said there is no housing deficit. He, yeah, that's, that's, that's what he said. He said that people moving from... Anyway, yeah, well, go on, please. <laughs> Let's not dwell on that. Right. <laughs> right. So if we work with roughly 20 million, as a um, percentage of number of households, you're looking at roughly 50% versus Ghana, where their deficit that you just said of 1.8 million is roughly about 22, 23%. So... Really, with the numbers we have, the issue is actually bigger in Nigeria. Right. But Ghana are taking a hold of their issue and mm. moving forward with it. And speaking of taking a hold of their issue, I, w w what do you make? They have a housing census. What do you make of the data-driven approach to, well, solving but, that problem? <laughs> well, you've answered the question right. yourself, or right. just, because you already said that our minister says there is no housing deficit. I don't think we can, in all seriousness, say that. Mm. And what really needs to happen is for us to do the census. But then again, I will remind you that we haven't done a national census since, since. Two, 2006 Correct. again. Um, and you need data. How can you begin to make quality decisions without the necessary information? Mm. That's why that 17 million uh, figure has been uh, bandied about so much. All right, uh, let's move to Kenya, to Eastern Africa. Um, the seven bilateral agreements signed with uh, Zimbabwe, there's, there's, and in fact, they just signed another one with Uganda on milk and so on and so forth. Um, all these bilateral agreements in the wake of the African continental free trade area, which, you know, it's, it's, it's in effect still, you know, has to, has to be fleshed out. Um, but what's your take on bilateral agreements still being signed when you've got a continental agreement that's supposed to expand trade across the nation? You know, how, how do you it's see that? It's not an entire surprise mm. because people, as you said, they're still fleshing out some of the continental agreements. They're still working to make it a true reality that impacts day-to-day -day business, right? Business activities. And I can see why some countries would think that a bilateral agreement helps them to quickly address some of the issues they're facing. But then one would argue that the effort they are making to reach and sign bilateral agreements 
is taking away from the effort they can be um, using towards addressing the continental right. free trade zone um, uh, issues. Right. But having said that, Zimbabwe is not typical in that you've got to remember that they've had um, sanctions against them since about 2002. Right. And those sanctions have been biting. So you can see why they have more of an impetus to try and sign these bilateral um, agreements. Mm. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Still in Kenya, uh, M-Pesa, every time M-Pesa makes the news, it just keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, 30 million active, uh, monthly active users. I mean, you know, what do you make of the growth? Kudos to them. Yeah. But as you can imagine, with COVID and the move towards greater use of technology in business and payment settlements, etc., it's it's not a... A surprise, but mm. it's a huge achievement. I saw a statistic that was saying that the number of businesses accepting one of their payment um, solutions doubled right. between April 2020 and now. Wow! Yeah, it was the, the, it's, according to them, the numbers were driven by businesses yes. uh, utilizing it. Yes. Okay, so that leads me to another question. Uh, Kenya, of course, has a telco-led model. There mm -hmm. are other African nations that favor more bank-led models for financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see that um, for, for all those other countries that perhaps have limits on mobile money and so on? Um, are they, can you sympathize with them not wanting telcos to become too dominant and powerful by having so many users? How, how do you see that dynamic? Well, I always ask myself, what is the objective? So if it's mobile money, what are we trying to achieve? What are the big things we're trying to achieve? Mm. And certainly in some of the countries, they have said that financial inclusion is one of the big objectives of you know, pushing mobile money. So you then have to ask yourself, well, if this is my objective, what have been the results? And compare the models. Right. So if you look at the number of active customers and passages said, um, in Kenya, right, that 30 million, it's roughly 60% of the Kenyan population. That's huge. So when you adjust it for what proportion of their population will be under the age of, say, 15, and not using mobile money, you mm. see that they've had serious penetration. And then you can compare that to the other countries you're talking about in terms of the level of penetration and financial inclusion. Mm. And I think you get your answer. Get, get the answer. All right, cool. So, but, but, so, so it should be results-driven regardless of whether or not the telcos end up becoming behemoths that you know, lord over other, in, other institutions. So you identify the risks and yeah. say, what mitigants can I put in place? To so reduce that. Yes, right, but, it, right. but it, if, you, if you're trying to achieve an objective, then you've got to think, what's the best way of achieving that objective? Mm. And... Yeah, and just put in risk mitigants. Amazing. I have follow-up. Sorry, this is a fascinating yeah, topic, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we, we had um, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, the managing director of a healthcare mm -hmm. firm, and mm -hmm. they were trying to push, you know, telemedicine where mm -hmm. you know customers can die, can you know speak with doctors mm -hmm. in different parts of the country, and they were they kept talking about the net, relying on the telco network. So it just seems like they're like an octopus, the telcos, right? Where they're, you know, um, other industries are leveraging on their networks and they just, they just seem like, the, the forecast just seem like they are going to be the biggest, going forward, the biggest companies we're in the, the world. We're because in the 21st century. Right. You know, if you look at even like a 5G, as uh, I think we had this exactly. conversation, yeah. 5G, we shouldn't think of it as an innovation in itself. Right. We should think of it as the enabling platform for so many other innovations. Right. And the more we have the, think of it as an enabling environment. Right. Are we going to say that we, we're not going to build roads because they're so important? We, it's another infrastructure. It's another utility. Right. And they just, they just happen to be the companies that benefit from that. So it is so what it is. buy shares. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and make sure you regulate them effectively mm. in a way that continues to drive growth, but not at the cost of the, the customers. Everybody else. Um, okay, so along that 
uh, line of conversation. Now we move to Meta, which is another company that has, you know, uh, talks of it getting too big and U.S. Uh, European uh, legislators wanting to break it up. Where they've inserted themselves into the conversation now, what do you make of this um, amendment of hate speech rules to allow for citizens to call for the uh, death of Russian soldiers and the president and the <laughs> Belarusian president as well? <laughs> Protests were in unusual times. Yeah. And unusual times, they require unusual measures. You can't use the same policies that worked in a pre-war time during a war. They did have to adjust. But what I didn't note is that the policies remain for credible cause against violence against Russian citizens. Right. So again, they've mitigated, shall mm. we say. It's, it's not a free-for-all. You can attack any Russian, which is what we don't want. Right, right. What do you make of the fallout of everything that's happened with uh, this war? Um, Kristalina Gorgieva has said that African nations will, I, I wrote it down, food prices going up, fuel prices going up, uh, tourism to be impacted, access to capital markets. Um, Zainab, in our last segment, Zainab Ahmed is amending the but Nigeria's budget, there just it just seems to be everywhere you turn, it's a negative impact on the on the on the rest of the world. Do you think this continues for the rest of this year, or there's a possibly a light at the end of the tunnel where cooler heads prevail and it ends soon? Because every sector seems to be impacted here. What I would remember last week, I said about just the interconnectivity right. of everything, of politics, of economics, right, right, yeah, right, social right, right. everything, but. In response to this question, I'll wait for your political analyst to come and tell us <laughs> what they think will happen with the war, and then I will come back in and talk about what I think the economic and business and social and every other implication is to that. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Sayade Okoli, CEO, Alpha African Advisory, thank you so much for joining us as always. We appreciate uh, your insights.